Excellent. Patrick, welcome to the show, sir. Thanks very much, Roger. Roger, good to be here. I think we're going to have a, an interesting conversation. Oh, there's no doubt about it. And I appreciate you taking time. And for our listeners, just so you know, I'm actually talking to Patrick right now. And he's in Ireland and I'm in Boulder. And I just think that is so cool. So yeah, let's jump right into it, Patrick. I want to I wanna really help people understand some basics first about breathing. And we're going to blow up a couple of misconceptions that are very prevalent in the community of first responders. And a lot of the first responders listening to this show, these are folks that are seeking that next level. They're really trying to improve themselves. They realize that there are a lot of limitations within the training that they currently have. It, it can only take them so far. And so the folks who listen to this show, firefighters, paramedics, police officers, tactical people, they're all really interested in some of that next level. And I've been training these folks now for oh, almost 30 years. And the interesting thing I notice is a lot of the basics are still being done incorrectly or not at the optimal level. So the first thing I wanted to jump into is why should we be breathing from the belly? Because most people in the first responder community are all in that upper chest area, especially under stress. What's the advantage of breathing from the diaphragm? There's a, a, quite a few advantages I suppose one of the one of the main advantages would be um, resilience in terms of better ability to handle stress. If we as individuals, if we breathe fast in upper chest, we're more likely to be in that fight or flight response. So it's not just that stress and anxiety puts us into fast and upper chest breathing, but fast and upper chest breathing feeds back into that stress and anxiety. And the central nervous system can become agitated or, you know, influenced incorrectly as a result of upper chest and fast breathing. So that's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is that our diaphragm breathing muscle is not just for respiration, but it's also for providing stabilization and stability for the spine. So in terms of if you were to think of the core, the trunk, you think of the diaphragm, which is the main breathing muscle at the base of the ribs to the top, You've got the pelvic floor to the bottom, you've got the abdominals to the front, and you've got the spinal muscles to the back. And it's by breathing diaphragmatically that it generates what's called intra-abdominal pressure. And this is for providing stability. And for example, a weightlifter, when they're lifting a weight, they will typically breathe in, they hold their breath. As they breathe in, the diaphragm is moving downwards and the abdomen becomes like a pneumatic balloon. So it's providing a bracing. So individuals with poor breathing patterns, they, I would say that, yes, very often it can affect the emotions. There's no questions about that. There is a link between the diaphragm and the emotions and also the speed of breathing to the emotions. It can affect posture. It can affect core strength. It can affect functional movement because your diaphragm, by generating intra-abdominal pressure, which is influenced by the zone of opposition, which is a kind of a syndrical area from the top of the diaphragm to the lower ribs. And you need functional breathing, allowing the diaphragm to move back up to its resting position to increase the area of the zone of opposition, which in turn is going to increase intra-abdominal pressure. So it's like that the abdomen is literally a pneumatic balloon. So anybody involved in strength, um, anybody involved in athleticism, Anybody who is, you know, in terms of functional movement, you can't have functional movement unless you have functional breathing. And if breathing is off, movement is off. And if movement is off, you're at greater risk of injury. Now, there's another aspect to this is sleep because your diaphragm is also connected with the upper airway dilator muscles in the throat. And this, will, of course, will feed back into performance as well because if you have individuals, especially men, uh, more it, like it affects sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea affects more men than women. Okay, when women hit 50, it does increase quite significantly there. But typically, men between the age of 30 and 49 years of age, typically it's about 26% of men are affected there. And from 50 years of age to 70, it's about 43%, so almost half. Now, what does it mean? Well, if you have poor breathing during your sleep, and if you are mouth breathing and your tongue is falling back into the throat or the throat itself is collapsing, it causes stopping of the breath. 
and the stopping of the breath will cause continuous sleep fragmentation. That individual is more likely to wake up feeling tired, but it also causes a stress to the heart. Now, as we put on weight, once we hit a certain age, it's easier to put on a few pounds. Once we put weight on the belly, it impinges the movement of the diaphragm, and it, as a result, it reduces lung volume. And as because there's a reduction to the volume of the lungs that we're using, the throat is more liable to collapse. And just one more point while it's in my head, why breathe low? Because the greatest concentration of blood in the human lungs is in the lower regions of the lungs. So in order to improve oxygen uptake in the blood, it's vital that we breathe in and out through our nose. And nasal breathing is directly connecting with the diaphragm. So many of, you know, many listeners will always, like people might say to me, well, they breathe through their nose. Do you breathe through your nose during physical exercise? Do you breathe your, through your nose during rest? Do you breathe through your nose during sleep? And even during running, when you break down, Roger, when you break down the reasons and the benefits of nasal breathing versus mouth breathing, there's no comparison. And, and flow state, you know, none of this stuff is new. Um, Dr. John Dullier wrote a paper published back in 1991, looking at the alpha wave, the brain wave states in individuals who were doing physical exercise with their mouth closed they were more likely to enter flow. So you can imagine somebody going for a run. They have their mouth open. They're breathing fast and shallow. It's causing agitation of the mind. They're more than likely in that sympathetic stress state. And with that, they are breathing shallow. So it's not, it's not efficient and it's not economical in terms of gas exchange, oxygen going from the lungs into the blood. So yeah, quite a few reasons there. And I probably missed a couple of them, but... Overall, that kind of gives you a, that there's a good, good number of reasons or benefits for it. Love that, Patrick. Yeah, the nose is for breathing. The mouth is for eating and talking. And let's just keep it there, right? Keep it simple. Yes. And, you know, when I think about the idea of belly breathing as well as nasal breathing, something I've been working on for a long time because I've, I've realized the benefits of it. Like it's tremendous. If you And anyone who doubts this is a truth, just practice. Get the Oxygen yeah. Advantage book and there's exercises in there that'll walk you through it. You're going to notice the advantages right away. And one of the most important ones for the first responder community, in my opinion, is the fact that it allows us to get into parasympathetic restoration. The emergency services person is in sympathetic dominance all the time, and especially in the law enforcement community, even when they're off duty, they're never relaxed. They go to a restaurant, they sit in the back of the restaurant to scan the whole thing for danger. When they're with their family, you know, they're they're carrying their gun off duty. They're they're in this state of sympathetic dominance all the time, and that wears you down. So to me, nasal breathing and belly breathing by restoring the parasympathetic restoration aspects of that, you're putting money back in the yeah. resiliency bank account. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think the human being, we, we aren't able to cope with long-term stress. We, we can't be switched on all the time. Eventually it leads to a depletion of resources, burnout, exhaustion syndrome, which can be related to your breathing patterns. But in terms of the breath itself, through our breathing, we can activate the parasympathetic or the body's relaxation response. When we take a breath in, that's more sympathetically driven. So on the inspiration, it's more sympathetically driven and it's the expiration that's parasympathetically driven. So whenever somebody wants to downregulate, they could take a very soft and light breath through their nose, no big breathing. And we'll probably talk about why why not take big breaths because of the effect it does in the biochemistry, but to activate the parasympathetic response, even by just gently breathing softly in through the nose and out at, at the top of the breath, bringing a total feeling of relaxation to the body and allowing a prolonged relaxed exhalation. Because as you have a prolonged and relaxed exhalation, it stimulates the vagus nerve. And also if you change the breathing rate down to 5.5 or six breaths per minute, during practice. So say for instance, somebody has had a really tough day and they want to downregulate before they go to sleep. Because if they don't downregulate, their sleep is going to be screwed up. They're going to be lying in bed. Their mind is going to be all over the place. Their sleep quality is not going to be deep. They're going to wake up exhausted 
and that's going to mess up the next day. So it's very important to downregulate for at least 15, 20 minutes before one goes to sleep to switch off. And the cadence of 5.5 to 6 breaths per minute, there are hundreds of studies backing this up for the last 30 years. None of it is new. Like there is a link between our breathing and what's called heart rate variability. That the heart rate variability is that the timing between heartbeats should be in random. It should be random, but in rhythm as well at the same time. And there's a connection between our breathing and the timing between our heartbeats. And that's called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. So if somebody was to locate their pulse, as they breathe in, they should notice that their heart rate is getting faster. And as they exhale gently, they should notice that their heart rate is slowing down, that the time between beats is getting longer on the exhalation. When we practice breathing 5.5 to six breaths per minute, it stimulates the vagus nerve, but it also influences pressure receptors inside the major blood vessels. So we have what's called baroreceptors in the aorta and also in the carotid arteries. And these pressure receptors are monitoring our blood pressure. When our blood pressure increases, these pressure receptors should automatically react by dilating the blood vessels and bringing down heart rate to normalize blood pressure. And conversely, if our blood pressure goes low, these baroreceptors should automatically react by causing blood vessels to constrict and an elevation to our heart rate to normalize blood pressure. And these, both of these things are a marker of resilience. So we can influence the autonomic nervous system, which is the automatic functioning of the body. And again, it's coming back to that 5.5, six breaths per minute. By doing that, and one could breathe in for five seconds and out for five seconds, and in for five seconds, and out for five seconds, or you could breathe in for four seconds, and out for six seconds. And I'll go through a little bit how to do, and I can guide, you know, I'll spend a couple of minutes that people can practice it as they're, as they're listening. So with that, so you, you're breathing six breaths per minute, you're stimulating the vagus nerve, you're exercising the baroreceptors. Both of these mechanisms are feeding into heart rate variability. Heart rate variability is a measure of vagal tone or resilience because we as human beings, we need, need to be able to react and we need a balance between the parasympathetic, which is rest and digest and the fight or flight response. We don't want to be switched off all the time and nor do we want to be switched on all the time. And resilience is a marker of an individual's adaptability to the environment that they are in. And it's really important you know, you look at the animal world, no animal is switched on all the time. Any of your owners there, they may have a dog or they may have a cat. I have a couple of dogs, I have a couple of cats out there. None of them feel guilty about taking a 20 minute nap. None of them feel guilty about switching off. It's only the human being that feels guilty. And, you know, nasal breathing is absolute, like I was waking up feeling exhausted for 20 years. I came across the, this breathing technique in 1998 as a result of poor health problems. I had chronic asthma, I had a stuffy nose, I was constantly mouth breathing, my sleep was all over the place, and you're expected to be focused and concentrated. And uh, two things I came across back in 1998. One was stillness of the mind, present moment awareness, focusing on the breath, and the second was functional breathing. Now with that then, we also do breath holding, to stress the body. So we, I suppose we have breathing exercises to downregulate, and then we have breathing exercises to upregulate. And there's a time and a place to do both. But for years, I was stuck in my head all the time, constantly thinking, and how on earth can we focus, can we concentrate, and have our attention on what we need to do, unless we have the ability to train the brain to be concentrated. And that's why I would say, Focusing on your breathing is a good first step to that. And even make changes to your breathing, not just about focusing on the airflow coming in and out of your nose, but also about making subtle changes because we can increase blood flow, we can increase oxygen delivery, we can open up the airways, we can improve sleep, and we can influence the autonomic nervous system by making subtle changes to breathing. Isn't that amazing that something so simple can have such a profound and essential 
on our health. I mean, this is just an absolute. You want to take yourself to the next level. Heck, if you just want to improve your average, just start these breathing techniques. It's phenomenal. And, you know, in, in response to what you had said there, I used an HRV trainer through the HeartMath Institute, and I've been playing with different forms of breath work to see, well, what gives me the greatest return on investment in terms of my heart rate variability. And I'm just here to testify to the audience that this is worth your time because you can get better and better at it very quickly. This is not hard to learn. You just have to be a little disciplined to practice it. And one of the things that I've been able to do when I'm really working on restoring myself, I can get myself so quiet that I can take one breath a minute which might sound insane to some people. I didn't start there, trust me. But I got there and that, if I do that on a night where I haven't slept well, or I traveled and I'm in a different time zone and I just, I, I need to catch up. If I do that kind of breathing for 15 or 20 minutes, I've replaced at least an hour and a half of sleep that night. And, you know, so this is really profound. Patrick, a lot of people, in the first responder community, when I do, I do an informal sleep survey on every class I've ever taught, and we're talking now tens of thousands, it's informal, it's anecdotal, but the average amount of sleep the first responder community gets is five hours a night, and it's restless. Harvard recently did a sleep study on law enforcement specifically and discovered that their sleep apnea rates were eight times higher than the average population eight times. So this is a really significant issue. And I know that a lot of people are mouth breathing at night. They might have the discipline in the daytime to, yeah. to be conscious about it, but at night their mouth drops open and, it, and I, the feedback I always get is, well, there's nothing I can do about that. Is that true? No. 20 years ago, I started taping my mouth. I used paper tape from a local drugstore or chemist, 3M one inch micropore tape. I did two things. I had a constantly stuffy nose and you can open up your nose by holding your breath. So if anybody is worried about their nose, if they have rhinitis, rhinitis is a stuffy nose. You can help alleviate rhinitis by simply holding your breath. Don't do it if you're pregnant and don't do it if you've got any serious cardiovascular issues. But to open up your nose, you could take a normal breath in and out through your nose, hold your nose and just start walking around, walk around your room, holding your breath and keep walking until you feel a fairly strong air hunger and then let go, but breathe in through your nose. And by holding your breath, carbon dioxide increases in the blood and nitric oxide also pools inside the nasal cavity. And the precise mechanism of how the nose is opening isn't known. However, you can decongest your nose. And the importance of that is if you have a stuffy nose, you are 1.8 times more likely to have obstructive sleep apnea. Now, the founding father of obstructive sleep apnea, the doctor who coined the phrase OSA back in the 1970s is a doctor called Dr. Christian Guimano. He passed away last year. He spoke about the importance of restoring nasal breathing during sleep as the major foundation in terms of getting a good quality of sleep. If you think of the anatomy of the nose and a lot of the work that I work with is with sleep, we're talking about the anatomy of the nasal airway. And a good airway, and I'm talking about, when I'm talking about the upper airway, so here, for example, is, is the nose itself. Here are the lips. Here's the nasal cavity here. And basically, the nasal cavity is sitting above the mouth. So if you were to put your tongue into the roof of the mouth and drag your tongue along the hard palate until you feel the soft palate at the back of the roof of the mouth, sitting above the roof of the mouth is your nasal cavity. Now, first of all, you will see absolutely no function of the mouth in terms of breathing. But here is the key. During obstructive sleep apnea, your airway can collapse in four different places. One is the soft palate can fall in against the throat and you stop breathing. The other is the tongue can fall in against the throat. Another is the flap here, the epiglottis can fall in against the throat. And number four is you can have collapse of the throat itself. Now this is influenced by a few different things. And Sleep medicine has changed a lot in the last four years. Number one, as you spoke, Roger, if you have the mouth open, your tongue isn't able to rest in the roof of the mouth. And if your tongue isn't resting in the roof of the mouth, 
because you can't have three quarters of your tongue resting in the roof of the mouth and breathe through the mouth. Anybody who breathes through their mouth during sleep, their tongue has to drop down so that air can pass over the tongue into the throat. But when the tongue drops down, it's going to encroach on the airways. Number two, when you breathe through your nose, you pick up a gas called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is released into the nasal cavity from the paranasal sinuses, also produced in the nasal cavity. And by breathing through your nose, nitric oxide is a signaling molecule for the upper airway dilator muscles to stay open. The muscles in your throat keep your airway open during the day. You know, we're not worried about these airways collapsing during the day, but during sleep, when the muscles relax, the airway collapses, we stop breathing during sleep, blood pressure is elevated, it's a big stress on the heart, you've got constant interruptions to your sleep, and your day is going to be affected, even though some people will not feel fatigued as a result of it, but it's putting a big stress on the body. Another aspect in terms of sleep is, if you breathe hard and fast, upper chest breathing, you're increasing the turbulence in the airway. And the airway is a pipe. And if you were to breathe nice and slow, soft breath in, very regular, nice, easy breathing, you've got a less, lot less turbulence inside in the airway. But if you have an individual who is breathing hard and fast, there's an increased negative pressure in the airway caused by breathing, which is going to cause the airway to collapse. Number four, if we're not using our diaphragm, as I said at the very start, it reduces lung volume. When there's a reduction to lung volume, the throat is more liable to collapse. So obstructive sleep apnea. Until about 2015, doctors were only looking at sleep apnea from an anatomical point of view. Now in the last four to five years, they recognize there's only one anatomical characteristic called PCRIT, and that's the suction pressure at which the airway collapses. They speak about three non-anatomical issues. One is related to breathing is called loop gain because how you breathe during the day is going to influence how you breathe during sleep. And if you have an individual who is breathing fast and hard during the day, that same individual goes home, they go to sleep, they're breathing hard and fast and their sleep is all over the place. No one should ever wake up with a dry mouth in the morning. If your sleep is being disrupted, you're more likely to have to get up to go to the bathroom during the night. You're having sleep fragmentation, meaning that you're not getting down. It's that deep quality of sleep. And, you know, I'll show you like we, this is one tape that you could just get in a drugstore. I'd say most people will have it anyway in the house. And I'll show you a couple of different options of tape because some people will be apprehensive about wearing this tape and you have your, you just take off about six inches or 10 centimeters. You fold a tab at one end and fold a tab at the other end and gently dry your lips. Mm -hmm. And that's one example. Now, another example that we've, well, we developed it actually for kids because children who outbreed, it can lead to craniofacial abnormalities in the ch child's face because the tongue isn't resting in the roof of the mouth. It can impact their sleep. It can impact their behavior, their concentration and academic development. So we developed, I couldn't, of course, I'm working with a lot of kids and I've got a couple of books out for kids and, you know, I couldn't get kids to tape up. So because of obvious reasons, if they were to get sick. So I had to develop a tape from Kinesio tape and it's very simple, but then we developed it for adults as well. And kinesio tape is a tape like this that you stretch around. It's developed in the shape to surround the lips and you stretch it and the pressure is brought, brings the lips together. And that keeps the mouth closed during sleep, but there's no risk. So for people who would be apprehensive about wearing the tape during sleep, one thing that I'll say about the nose is the more you use your nose, the better it works for you. Most people, when they feel that their nose is stuffy, they start going around with their mouths open. You, can't be, you cannot be at your full potential as a mouth breather. I was there mouth breathing for 20 years. I was exhausted all the time. I was stressed all the time. And I would say probably most people who reach the upper echelons of the individuals who are listening to your podcasts, I would say there's very few of them mouth breathers. 
And the reason being is because they wouldn't have reached that level if they were a mouth breather. But maybe when we're younger, you know, we're more likely to breathe through the nose. And especially during sleep, once we hit 40 years of age, we are six times more likely to sleep with an open mouth. So you can think of that. If you, you know, if we don't have good sleep quality, we don't have rest, we don't have recovery. And that is going to translate into everything that we do during the day. And I often consider, I have people coming in with anxiety and panic disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder as well. We've looked at applying these breathing techniques, six breaths per minute, the biochemistry aspect of breathing to improve blood flow to the brain, breathing using the dye from the low regions of the lungs to bring in terms of a calmness to the mind, but also taping these individuals' mouths closed at night. And here's the reason. There is a connection between our breathing and our sleep. I don't have my, my manual with me. I was going to show you a diagram, but I'll explain it. If the mind is off, our sleep is impacted. If our mind is racing and we go to bed, we can't fall asleep easy. And as a result, we have a poor quality of sleep and we wake up exhausted. But when we wake up exhausted, it feeds back into the emotions of the mind. Because when you're exhausted, you're not in good form. And it's easy that situations can set you off. When your emotions are off, your breathing is impacted. You breathe faster and shallow. When you breathe faster and shallow, it feeds into your emotions. And when you breathe fast and shallow, it feeds into your sleep. You're more likely to snore. You're more likely to stop breathing. And that feeds back into the emotions. So we need to consider breathing as a three-dimensional, the bi-directional relationship how the emotions, concentration, attention, energy levels feed into performance and the impact that sleep and breathing has on both on, the, on those functions. Patrick, <clears throat> excuse me, Patrick, that was an amazing breakdown of that entire process. Thank you so much for that. The taping of the mouth, I didn't realize you had developed that particular tape that gives you the option to open up the mouth and feel a little bit safer. I can imagine that's a game changer right there for a lot of people who might dismiss that right away. I'm not taping my mouth at night. Are you crazy? Yeah. Uh, how do we get a hold of that tape? I've never seen it. Yeah, it only came out a couple of months ago. I was a few months in the process because I had to alter glue and I had to make sure that it was cotton and hypoallergenic. The tape is called myotape.com. And the reason it's called myotape is because of myofunctional therapy. And orthodontists, many orthodontists will use myofunctional therapy with children. So as I said, like my initial kind of motive for the tape was for kids. I needed to get children to breathe through the nose. And 25 to 50% of study children persistently mouth breathe. But the issue with kids is that their face is growing. And if the child is not breathing correctly with the tongue in the roof of the mouth, because it's the tongue that exerts a pressure to help develop the maxilla, which is the top jaw. But the human face is getting smaller and it's getting smaller and partly because of mouth breathing and lack of chewing and probably lack of reduced breastfeeding and other things as well. But the issue with this is that the airway is getting smaller. Like when we're talking about this airway, airway trumps everything because we can only survive without air for a couple of minutes. You know, well, people who are trained can last for longer, but in general, we can only survive without air for a couple of minutes. A good airway is the size of your thumb, and a poor airway is the size of a big biro. And there's some wonderful people from the United States behind this and really pushing it. One is called Dr. William Hang. He's an orthodontist from Agoura Hills in California. And he must be 30 years because as an orthodontist, he will understand about airway. And he's obviously seen over the years that individuals coming into him who were mouth breathing, that they had high upper palate, they had an infringed nasal cavity, that their jaws are set back, that their airway is compromised, that they were more likely to have obstructive sleep apnea, that their high blood pressure is a result of it. So he as an orthodontist was concerned, I'm not just going to straighten teeth. I want to look at Number one is the airway. And number two is get the teeth straight. So when a child comes into him, his whole emphasis on, on forward development of the jaws, 
to make sure that the airway is, com is not compromised. My airway is compromised, I'd never be an athlete because you can't be an athlete unless you have the airway to bring air to and from the lungs. So I, you know, watch this space here, Roger, because this has been debated in dentistry since 1909. I have, if you went in online, there's a journal that was around at the time. I think it's a US journal called the Dental Cosmos. And they showed that children who were persistently mouth breathing, they had lack of attention. They couldn't concentrate. They were sleepy. The face was dull and expressionless. The children was accusing the kid giving out to the child because they didn't have the focus. And it's not just about children. But I know like when I switched to nasal breathing during sleep, the difference when I woke up, um, the first morning I was kind of getting used to it. The second morning I woke up and I felt more alert than I had ever felt in my preceding 20 years. And that's why I, you know, like I might, my background is economics. I never was going to teach breathing, but it was the impact that it made to my health. Those two things, the ability to control my mind and not to be running off with incessant and critical thinking, you know, and the other aspect was functional breathing and sleep and they all go together. That is profound. And folks, for those of you listening, I can absolutely endorse and back up everything Patrick just said. And imagine how this is a total game changer, not just for you, but for your family, for your children and the development of your children, mind, body, spirit. There is no downside here. It's phenomenal. Patrick, I want to blow up a myth and there's a specific technique that law enforcement uses and the military uses to combat this. But first and foremost, before we jump into that technique, I want to blow up the misconception about gulping oxygen when we're in a state of needing more air. The standard yeah. belief is, yeah, just suck as much air as you possibly can. Well, there's obviously a lot of downsides to that, but I'd yeah. like to hear why that doesn't work? Why is that not necessary and even counterproductive to peak performance? Well, when we breathe normally, our blood oxygen saturation is normally saturated at 95 to 99%. And blood oxygen saturation refers to how fully loaded are the hemoglobin molecules with oxygen. And hemoglobin is a protein in the red blood cells that carry oxygen. And 98% of oxygen is carried by hemoglobin. So, normal breathing, our blood is already almost fully saturated. And we don't want our blood to be 100% saturated either because we need blood to be releasing oxygen to the tissues and organs for use. When we breathe hard, we are not necessarily increasing oxygen in the blood. Now, I, I will qualify that in a little bit. I'll go in a little bit more detail. But when we breathe hard, we are getting rid of too much carbon dioxide from the blood. Carbon dioxide is not just a waste gas. In actual fact, first responders up until the 1930s in the United States had canisters of carbon dioxide in their trucks. And it took the work of one medical doctor by the surname of Waters. And he said that carbon dioxide is toxic like urine. And as a result, carbon dioxide got bad press. But carbon dioxide before that was used because what does carbon dioxide do? It's not just that waste gas that we talk about, even though we breathe to get rid of excess CO2. Carbon dioxide is a vasodilator. Many people who breathe too hard, they have a habit of over-breathing during the day, during sleep, during exercise. If you breathe too hard during the day, you are going to gas out too soon during physical exercise. Hard breathing is blowing off too much carbon dioxide, the loss of CO2 is causing blood vessels to constrict. So a very common symptom of breathing too hard is cold hands, cold feet, and brain fog. Some of your listeners will identify with that. They may be going around with their mouth open, they're breathing fast and shallow, and they notice they have cold hands. It's not just that the blood vessels in the hands are constricting, but we have about 70,000 miles of blood vessels throughout the human body. Our entire blood circulation is affected by the volume of air that we breathe. So, you know, this hard breathing idea that we see it, and we see it literally everywhere, 
We hear it in yoga, for example. You know, we hear it in Pilates. We hear it in different gyms and different techniques. It doesn't make sense to breathe hard because if your body, if your blood is already almost fully saturated, breathing hard isn't increasing that, but instead breathing hard is getting rid of too much carbon dioxide. And not only are your blood vessels constricting because of the loss of CO2, but also the bond between oxygen and the red blood cells becomes tighter. And this is known as the Bohr effect. This was discovered by a Danish physiologist in 1904. And he said that the pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood, it's the pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood and the resultant blood pH that's a catalyst for red blood cells to release oxygen more readily to the tissues. So I suppose the best way to think of it would be this. And if people want to look a little bit more into it, look at the Bohr effect, B-O-H-R. Look at the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve that when you breathe hard, the curve shifts to the left and your red blood cells hold on to oxygen instead of releasing it. Now, so here might be the question. Well, somebody might say to me, well, I'll give you this example. I remember being in a, ho in a hotel a few years ago. I was doing some training course there. And this is probably going back 10, 12 years ago. And this man started having a heart attack inside in the hotel. And uh, I, you know, I was there, but... I wasn't the first on the scene or anything like that, but there were a couple of nurses from the local hospital there. And I just watched from a distance what the nurses were saying to the man. They were telling him to breathe hard, breathe big, breathe deep. And they were getting him to hyperventilate. Now, this is unfortunate because hyperventilation, and this has been written about in various medical journals, if you hyperventilate, it reduces blood flow and oxygen delivery to the heart. So it was the wrong thing to do. It was also putting them into a stress response. But I understand their motive. Their motive was good because they had a belief that if I can get this individual to breathe hard, I'm going to improve them. However, if I was in that situation and you come across somebody, immediately I would put my hands on their either side of their lower ribs. And I would ask them to breathe in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five. In other words, when we consider the shape of the human lungs, we have to consider that the greatest blood flow is in the lower regions of the lungs. I need them to breathe slow, but I also need them to breathe light because I don't want to get rid of too much carbon dioxide, but I also want them to breathe deep. And that will improve gas exchange. And this has been looked at in terms of individuals going up into altitude. Like there's been studies on it in terms of individuals that were at a height of about 5,000 meters, which is a fairly considerable altitude. Their blood oxygen saturation at that height was down to 80%. They got the individuals to breathe six breaths per minute with lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs. And it increased their SpO2 from 80% up to 89%. I remember a woman coming into me with chronic heart failure. I was having her go for a walk in my office and we used pulse oximeter as well. And she was dropping down to 92% going for the walk. How was she breathing? She was breathing fast and shallow. And if you think of the human airway, if we're breathing fast and shallow, we're wasting an awful lot of air in dead space. We're not improving or increasing what's called alveolar ventilation. So I had her put her hands on either side of her lower two ribs. And I said, I need you to breathe through your nose. And I need you to breathe in two, three, four, out two, three, four, five. And I kept that going. And her blood oxygen saturation came up from 92% to 96%. So from just on the verge of mild hypoxia, just inside normal, normal blood oxygen saturation. So we can influence that through our breathing. But if I was to say to her, I want you to start breathing hard and fast, it's not going to have that impact. But the thing is, when people are stressed, they feel the right thing to do is to breathe fast and shallow. But fast and shallow breathing, it's uneconomical, it's inefficient, and it's not improving blood oxygen saturation. Beautiful. And so I want to follow up with that specific to the first responder community and peak performance. So as you know, 
they get the call and they don't get time to warm up, to stretch, to practice, right? You go from zero to a hundred. That might be running yes. into a burning building, pulling someone out of a car, chasing a suspect, or even yep. fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat for your life. Yep. So the one breathing technique that has been predominant for the last couple of decades, both in the military and, and usually what happens in the military makes it to law enforcement or first responder communities. And that is, it's called combat breathing or box breathing. And the box breathing, just for folks listening who may not be familiar with it, you inhale, you hold, you exhale, you hold, and you try to do that in the same pentameter. If you inhale for a count of three, you hold for a count of three, et cetera. First and foremost, what do you think about box breathing and can we improve upon that model or is that one of the best ways to get ourselves back into a normal place where we can actually deal with the emergency? It's an interesting, Brett. Um, if you were to breathe in for four seconds, now I'm assuming individuals are using their nose, but breathing in for four seconds and holding, it's giving enough time for oxygen to transfer from the lungs into the blood. You're breathing out for four seconds. So during that time, you're breathing out. You could say, yeah, prolonged exhalation is activating a parasympathetic response, but then you hold for four seconds. Nitric oxide during that time will pool in the nasal cavity and carbon dioxide will increase in the blood a little bit. And then you breathe in for four. You're carrying that nitric oxide from your nose into the lungs and the increased carbon dioxide is causing oxygen to be released from the red blood cells to the tissues. An interesting exercise. Um, would I improve it? Well, you know, I'm not to be the one to say, but I'm gonna give you what I do with pre-competition with MMA fighters going into a ring. I used it first with presentations that I was giving with public speaking. I would typically spend a certain few minutes with slow lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs, breathing in and out through the nose, hand on either side. And as you're breathing in, I would be breathing in for a count of five and I would be breathing out for a count of five. And I do that to stimulate the vagus nerve. That calms the body and mind, but you don't want to go into a situation too calm, but you want to go in focused, but it calms down anxiety. And that's a big part of it. So for athletes who are prone to anxiety, if their head is a bit all over the place, it's not going to be, they're not going to have a good game. We need absolute you know, we need attention and we need the balance whereby the individual is alert, but they are relaxed at the same time. You're trying to catch that balance. So I have them do slow breathing during their warm up. But if you were in a truck, you know, you could be doing it in a truck, but then they're too relaxed. I have them do really strong breath holds to bring them into that up regulation. So slow breathing first for a period of time, breathing in for five seconds, <clears throat> breathing out for five seconds breathing in for five seconds, breathing out for five seconds. And then if you were driving, well, you couldn't really do it driving, but say for instance, if you were being driven, then take a breath in through your nose, a breath out through your nose, hold your nose, and you could just nod your head up and down or just move about or hold your breath for say 15, 20 seconds. Do a couple of easy ones and then wait about 30 seconds and then breathe in, breathe out and hold your breath and hold your breath for as long as you can. Hold your breath for as long as you can, let go and breathe. Breathe for 30 seconds to a minute, do it again. And do a couple of repetitions of that. Why? Number one is if you hold your breath for more than 30 seconds, your spleen contracts and your spleen contains 8% of your red blood cells. And if you do five maximum breath holds, your spleen is going to release red blood cells into circulation. So that's one aspect. Number two, when you do a long breath hold, you are increasing blood flow to the brain. So it's not that when we do a long breath hold, it's not that blood oxygen, it's not that the oxygen delivery to the brain drops. Because what happens is that when we do a long breath hold, yes, carbon dioxide, sorry, oxygen levels can drop a little bit during that time, but carbon dioxide is going to increase. And it's the increased carbon dioxide which is going to open up the blood flow to the brain, but also cause a right shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. So more oxygen gets delivered. So it's an up regulator. So I suppose I want to have calmness of the mind on one hand, but I don't want to be too relaxed. And then we stress the body by doing the longer breath holds. 
So I think box breathing is a kind of a variation of that to some extent, but I'm going from a really calm state to a stress state. I'm going out there. The other thing about doing strong breath holds, it opens up your nose, it'll help open up your lungs. And, you know, it's not the time to start doing breathing exercises is, is not en route to the emergency. The time, the time to start doing breathing exercises are when things are going pretty good. And then you can tap into this. And it's a tremendous resource because your breath is always that constant companion that you have. And by taking your attention out of the mind onto the breath, that you, you're able to harness that your, your attention is moving simultaneously with time. Some people will call it the flow or they call it the zone or present moment. It doesn't matter. It just means that you have the focus to have full capacity to be attentive. And one, my point to the, in case I forget, Roger, individuals going into a burning building, they're wearing a tank of gas on, on their back. If those individuals are breathing poorly, they're, they are going to go through that tank, you know? So we need to wonder how, and you know, individuals who are doing physical exercise or individuals who are under stress, we also need to have conservation of the breath. You think of say an unfit individual walking down a sidewalk. That guy is huffing and puffing. He's going for a walk, but he's breathing hard for that given duration and you know, intensity of physical exercise. It's his everyday breathing that's influencing how he's breathing during physical exercise. When we practice breathing exercises, a combination of breathing exercises, reduced volume breathing to, to reduce the sensitivity of the body to carbon dioxide buildup. We do biomechanical breathing to get diaphragm going. We do cadence breathing for the autonomic nervous system. We also do breath holding to stress the body, but this will translate into a higher bolt score. And a bolt score since 1975, breath hold time is regarded as a measurement of breathlessness during physical exercise. So it's a very simple measurement. You have to be sitting down for about five minutes, allow your breathing to settle, take a normal breath in and out through your nose. You hold your breath and you time it in seconds until you feel the first definite desire to breathe. And when you let go, your breathing should be fairly normal. If you have less than 25 seconds, there is a very high likelihood that you have dysfunctional breathing. And if you have dysfunctional breathing, you have disproportionate breathlessness for physical exercise, gassing out too soon. But you can also have respiratory muscle fatigue, but also you could have increased, for example, increased lactic acid um, in terms of because if you're breathing too hard, it's not causing more oxygen to get delivered throughout the body. It's causing less. So I would say anybody involved in any sort of peak fitness, the minimum bolt score that they should have is a minimum of 25 seconds and a goal of 40. One of our instructors is SWAT, Special Weapons and Tactics, Joey Williams. And he won't mind me using his name because he's put it out there public. And he's an instructor in Berkeley, California with his own personnel. And he gets all of his guys going through the hoops in terms of nasal breathing for, during physical exercise. And he has a requirement that he's looking to get their bolt score up to 40 seconds. Their breathing then is light during physical exercise. Their breathing is light during sleep. So they have a good quality of sleep and they're not going to be gassing out too soon. And most people, when, you know, if you think of your first responders, how many of them are going to breathe through their nose during physical exercise? It's going to be the same as the normal population, very few and far between. But if you breathe through your nose during physical exercise, initially it's more difficult because there's an increased air hunger because the carbon dioxide that's increasing in the blood cannot leave the body so quickly through the lungs. <clears throat> However, if you continue doing all of your physical exercise with your mouth closed, the body adopts to the increased carbon dioxide, the air hunger diminishes, and then for a given intensity of physical exercise, you need less air. So George Dallam, the science is only catching up in this. We, we have been talking about it for 20 years. George Dallam is a professor in one of the universities in the United States. He's a, he's a well-known triathlete, D-A-L-L-A-M. 
and he did a study there. It was published in 2018. He got a group of 10 recreational athletes and he got them to breathe through their nose for a period of six months during all of their physical exercise. He then test, tested them, nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. With nasal breathing, they were able to achieve 100% work rate intensity, but they had 22% less ventilation. Now that's a huge saving there. You know, you can do the same, you can achieve and push yourself as hard as you could go, but with 22% less ventilation. And there's a saving there in terms of not gassing out too soon. So anybody during rest, if they have fast upper chest breathing, they are likely to gas out. And it's not that these people might be in poor breathing condition. Sorry, it's not that these people are in poor condition, that they are deconditioned, not necessarily. They just could have poor breathing. We need to change their breathing patterns. Really appreciating that. This might shock you, Patrick, but since I read your book for about the last year, I've been checking the Bolt score of my students in the class. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you something that might startle you. Maybe, maybe not. The average is six seconds. Yeah, it's very, six is very low. Very um, low. And very, very, low. very few are above 20. Like it yeah. is extremely rare to have a student go beyond 20. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of work to do here. No doubt about it. Yeah. And I think it's an awareness. Like I've seen Olympic athletes with, with both scores of 12 seconds. And, you know, I, in, at the back of my mind, I was wondering how on earth did this guy compete? Because in order for him to achieve his goals, he had to put his body through trauma. I, you know, sometimes with, with, with breathing, it's worth just even taking a small step back to go two steps forward. And you can bring in small changes in your breathing that will reflect fairly quickly for sleep, for the emotions and for physical exercise. You know, it's, but it is normal, unfortunately, that Brett told time. Individuals who are more prone to issues with breathing are people prone to anxiety and panic disorder. And also people who are prone to say early asthma as kids, if they had childhood asthma, even if they grew out of asthma, there can be still an underlying issue there that can be causing their breathing to be a little bit labored, but that can be all, that can be trained and it can be trained once the person has, has an awareness of, you know, reducing their breathing volume. So I would say to your listeners is sit down into a chair, Put one hand on your chest, put one hand just above your navel and follow the airflow coming in and out of your nose. And now start gently slowing down the speed of your breathing and slow down the speed of your breathing to the point that you feel hardly any air coming into your nose. So really slow it down your breathing to the point that you feel hardly any air coming into your nose. And at the top of the breath, bring a total feeling of relaxation to the body so that you're having a relaxed and gentle breath out. Then when you need to breathe, take a very soft and light gentle breath in. At the top of the breath, bring a total feeling of relaxation to the body. Do that for four or five minutes. Check the saliva in your mouth and check the internal temperature of your fingers. What you will have done there is by slowing down your breathing to reduce the volume of air that you are breathing into your body, you should feel a slight feeling of suffocation. But that slight feeling of suffocation is indicating that carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood. And as carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood, your blood vessels dilate. But also, your mind is more likely to be anchored onto the breath when you have a feeling of suffocation. So in terms of mindfulness and anapanasati, the mind can be likely to wander. But in terms of the feeling of suffocation, the mind is more likely to be focused onto the breath. And it does activate the parasympathetic response by virtue of increased watery saliva in the mouth. Now, I would like people to give that a go. Can you influence your blood circulation through your breathing? And that's looking at the biochemistry of the breath. Then if you're breathing upper chest, place your hands either side of your lower two ribs, sit back, and as you breathe in, just gently, that as you breathe in, you're feeling your lower ribs moving out and you want to have your hands either side and not to do it by hearing your breathing. So as you breathe in, your ribs are gently moving out 
And as you breathe out, your ribs are gently moving in. And as you breathe out, allow your diaphragm to move back up to its resting position because this main breathing muscle here is absolutely essential to help avoid, you know, using the diaphragm for functional movement, reduce risk of injury, and reduce risk of lower back pain. And individuals who are prone to lower back pain, very commonly, they are breathing faulty in upper chest. And I'm writing a new book, and that's why all of this information is kind of fresh to my head, because I'm kind of going through functional movement, back pain, heart rate variability, type 1 diabetes. So we're looking at the oxygen advantage, but at a greater kind of, you know, spreading it out and trying to put genuine, I'm not, it's not like anything that I have to put together. I have to be able to show that I can back it up as best I can. Now, sometimes the science is only catching up, but, you know, in terms of, we can generally join the dots together. And I think some of the best ways to, um, to determine the truth in terms of breathing is to put it into practice. If any of your people have stuffy noses, once they're not pregnant or once they don't have any serious kind of medical issues, take a normal breath in and out through the nose, pinch the nose and walk holding the breath. And they could even count the number of paces that they're holding their breath for. That's called the maximum breathlessness test. And both of the tests are on our homepage of oxygenadvantage.com. So the bold score is there and the maximum breathlessness test the maximum breathlessness test, if I have an athlete coming into me, I need them to have a bolt score minimum of 25 seconds and a goal of 40. And a maximum breathlessness test, a minimum of 60 paces and a goal of 80 paces. So it doesn't happen overnight, but we know that when they can improve their bolt score, their breathlessness during physical exercise is less. They are breathing slower. They're more likely to breathe using their diaphragm their sleep, emotions, and physical performance is better. And then the maximum breathlessness test would be something akin to, you know, not quite measuring repeated sprint ability, but repeated sprint ability would be a very good performance indicator for, for military, for police personnel. I could only imagine that if you had somebody is running after somebody, but then they lose them. They've got a very brief recovery before they have to run off again. So it would be like, you know, somebody in MMA, you know, you're, you're, there's a burst of high intensity. There's a very brief recovery before a burst again. So repeated sprint ability is how many reps can you go at full intensity before exhaustion? And we have used exhaling, exhale hold technique. In other words, to give you an example of how you could do this, this is not for pregnancy either, by the way. Take a normal breath in and out through your nose. Hold your nose. Start walking, holding your breath. Then walk faster. Then go into a jog. Go into a run. Go into a sprint, holding your breath. Keep relaxing into the body. When it gets difficult, let go. Breathe in through your nose, but minimize your breathing for about six breaths or so to prolong the hypoxic, hypercaptic response. And then have normal breathing for about... 12 to 18 breaths. Now it's safe because we are not hyperventilating before the breath holds. So blood oxygen saturation typically will go down to about 85%. Carbon dioxide increases to plus 50. This disturbs the blood acid base balance that we're stimulating anaerobic glycolysis at a far stronger degree than high intensity interval training. And also there's less trauma because you could even do it as a jog and what we're doing is we're provoking the body to make adaptations. And I will give you an example. Using this with elite professional rugby union players who are, they're professional guys, so they're at the top of their fitness. In four weeks, divided, they were divided into two groups. One group was doing 40 meter sprints on a breath hold with a departure every 30 seconds. And the other group was doing their normal anaerobic training. And after four weeks, the group who, who were doing the breath hold training, their repeated sprints increased from nine to 14.8 before exhaustion. And the control group who were doing high intensity interval training, they increased from nine to about 10.2. It was marginal. Now, normally at an elite or professional level in terms of athletics, 
if you can get a 1% or even a half percent improvement, that's significant. But to be able to improve a performance indicator such as repeated sprintability from nine to 14.8 just in four weeks, and it was only by doing two sets a week over, and the last week was three sets. So I suppose, Roger, it's, you know, you're looking at functional breathing. I'm looking at how is the person breathing when they're at rest, when they're asleep, when they're doing physical exercise and get the foundation of functional breathing right because we can improve oxygen uptake. We can improve blood circulation. We can help open up the airways. We can influence the functioning of the autonomic nervous system. We can downregulate, but also do breath holding to stress the body. And that's an upregulator and to force the body to make adaptations. And I'm not saying it's a cure all, but I have spent 18 years looking and putting and there are sufficient, there are sufficient papers and studies out there now to show that, yes, you can impart these benefits. Patrick, I'm super appreciating that breakdown. And, you know, for this audience, they start with cynicism and skepticism. It's just how they approach life. So my sure. advice to everyone is go do it. Get the book, yeah. the Oxygen Advantage, and go practice. And what you're going to get is what I got for sure, immediate tangible result. You notice it right away and it just keeps getting better and better. Yeah. You know, there's there's a trend right now to wear these masks that yes. reduce the amount of oxygen. Right yeah. now, I live at 8,500 feet and yeah. I know that some of the techniques in the oxygen advantage are to kind of simulate a yeah. higher elevation, right? And I know for a fact, when I go from where I live down into Denver, which is a mile high, yeah. I'm already at an increase in my ability to perform. And when I go down to sea level, I'm at God status. Like I literally can't get tired. Yes. Do yes. you uh, approve of these masks or are the techniques we're using in the oxygen advantage something that could be better than or even replace that mask? Where are you at on the mask issue? Okay. The, the, mask, the mask, we have our own masks. So that's what I'm showing you there. Um, it's called sports mask. And I will tell you what the mask does and what the mask doesn't do. Number one, when the mask came out, first of all, maybe six years ago, it was branded as simulating altitude training. The mask itself, wearing a mask, does not lower your blood oxygen saturation. At the time, I tested the masks using treadmills, using pulse oximeter, your blood oxygen saturation will drop hardly down into hypoxic. So it's not a hypoxic training device. What the mask is, it's a respiratory muscle training device. So you're breathing against resistance. So say, for example, if I put this one on here, I'll just put it on briefly. And there's valves to the front of it, but it's also pooling carbon dioxide. So you see that there's plenty of dead space there to pool carbon dioxide. So we have our own athletes train with masks. Um, you have a valve. And that you're breathing against resistance to add an extra load onto the breathing muscles. So number one is it's training and strengthening the breathing muscles. You have to breathe through your nose while you're wearing the mask. Number two, it pools carbon dioxide inside the mask. And when you're exposing the body to higher amounts of carbon dioxide in the blood, you are reducing the sensitivity of the body to the gas carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is the primary stimulus to breathe. If you were able to tolerate higher CO2 in the blood, your breathing is going to be lighter. Now, what we do with oxygen advantage is we then do breath holding with the mask. So should somebody buy the mask? Well, what I would say is start with nasal breathing. Nasal breathing is going to impose a load onto your breathing muscles. And that may help to improve diaphragmatic strength. Nasal breathing is going to increase carbon dioxide in the blood. And when you sustain your physical exercise with your mouth closed, you will start then having improved performance in terms of reduced breathlessness. Now, the only thing I would say is individuals with a nose like mine, where the nose is all over the place and a deviated septum, they might have to get a nasal dilator. And that's based on this. If you put one finger here, Roger, and one finger here, and if you gently prise your nostrils, so I have one finger on either side of my nose, I'm gently prising them. 
in order to allow more air to come in. So some guys will have better noses than others. And some guys will have a higher boat score than others. Those guys with a better nasal cavity and with a higher boat score will be better able to sustain nasal breathing. So the mask, when it first came out with simulation of altitude training, you can only do that if you're applying exercises while wearing the mask. Otherwise, wearing the mask itself doesn't simulate anything. Awesome. And for people who want to get that mask, where do they find that, Patrick? So it's on sportsmask.com. Beautiful. Sportsmask.com. Thank you for that. All these tips are just phenomenal. Love it. When we think about some of our older officers, so, you know, here's the deal. And when someone starts the job, they're typically in their 20s. They go to the police academy. There's a fitness program there. Uh, It's pretty intensive. I used to lead a fitness program in the police academy. And so the average person who comes into law enforcement, specifically law enforcement fire services, where there's a lot of physical stuff, in their 20s, they're in better shape than the average 20-year-old in the population. Mm -hmm. But by the time they're in their 40s and 50s, they're in worse shape than the average 40 or 50 year old in the population. Now, if we think about America, the outrageous obesity rates and all the stuff that goes along with that, to think that a police officer is in worse physical condition than the average person is a bit startling, but it's absolutely true. Yes. If someone is in that space, they're in their 40s and 50s, they have some compromised physiology where's a good place to start for them? Because I know some of this could be a little too stressful on the body as they're aging. Yeah. 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 I would start with sleep. And the reason being is because if sleep is being compromised and if sleep quality isn't good enough, um, or if they're stopping breathing during sleep, if they're not getting recovery, it, it messes up hormones. And one hormone is called ghrelin and ghrelin is a food stimulant. So if you have an individual with obstructive sleep apnea, it's more likely to happen that age category. And especially when we put on a bit of weight, like I'm nearly 50. So I'm in that age category that I have to be conscious of breathing through my nose during sleep, slow breathing and light breathing. So it's a vicious circle. You have disrupted sleep. Then you're craving food the following day. You eat more food, you put on weight and that messes up your sleep. And then, of course, when we put on a bit of weight, the breathlessness is more likely because we're carrying an extra load. You know, it's like some guy said to me, well, if you're three or three or four stone, I I don't know what your metrics are in the States. I can't remember. You know, it's like you have a you're carrying two spare tires around your midriff and that's going to increase breathlessness. What I would say is for that group is get start breathing through your nose first during sleep. Really, really important. Have your tongue resting in the roof of the mouth. Don't lie on your back because your tongue is more likely to fall into the airway and your lower jaw fall back and that can shut off your airway. Go for walks, even fast walks, or even if you haven't exercised or it's been a while, go for a jog with your mouth closed for one minute and then walk with your mouth closed for one minute and then jog with your mouth closed for one minute. It's all about starting off very, very basic steps because If you can enjoy it, you'll stick with it. And then when you have downtime in the evening, sit back into a chair, put maybe your attention onto your breath and start slowing down the speed of your breathing and see if you can influence your blood circulation and downregulate before sleep. And I would say to people as well, don't leave your head stuck in a phone. It is crazy that these big corporations have commanded and consumed so much time of everybody now in the Western world. And it's taught that up to two and a half hours of our time is consumed by looking into a phone. I'm very selective to the best that I can. I live out in nature a little bit like you. I'm slightly off the grid. I can just show you there and you can get an example of it. So in terms of, you see that I'm literally in the middle of nowhere. (laughs) <laughs> and I use that because it's very good for headspace. But it's also very good for headspace not to listen to the news constantly throughout the day. 
if you want to listen to the news and if you want to be kept up to date with, say, COVID, listen to it once a day and then switch off all major news feeds. And the reason being is because a lot of the information that's being selected, regardless of who you listen to, it's biased, it's negative, and it's stressful. So you're already working in an occupation whereby you were exposed to stress. And why in your downtime, look into a phone and expose yourself to more stress. Instead, give yourself some attention. Put the phone aside, close your eyes, or even just sit back into a chair, bring your attention onto the breath, connect with your breathing. It's a great way to train the brain. Focusing on your breathing isn't something, it's not just something for the trig hugger, tree huggers or open sandal brigade or that group. It's for people with resilience. It's for people who want concentration. It's for people who want focus. Because if your mind is all over the place, you are not going to have the attention and the quality of detail on the task and the likelihood of making mistakes increases, stress is increasing. So we need to train our resilience and focusing on the breath is that one thing that we can do. So yeah, so somebody of the same age as me, I would really look at sleep. That was the biggest thing, the easiest thing to make the biggest difference. And then, like, I'm not an athlete, so I will do physical exercise. I get in an hour today, all with nasal breathing. And initially, it's a bit tougher. And you want to challenge yourself, but you don't want to feel stressed. So if you feel a bit stressed, back off a little bit. And I'd say gently build it up. If you wanted to increase the intensity, increase it by no more than 10% each week. And when you start noticing your both score increasing, your breathlessness during physical exercise is decreasing, you'll enjoy it more, and then you're more likely to stick with it. Love that. That is absolutely awesome. What a great summation. Patrick, I know we're getting toward the end of our time together, and I just wanted to give you the last word. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you think is important for this population of people to know? I think the only thing, you know, in terms of is put it into practice. Um, we're not selling it, you know, there's nothing to be sold here. It's, it's really about something that you carry with you. You carry your breath with you all day long, pay attention to your breathing. And if you notice yourself breathing fast, mouth breathing, upper chest breathing, or sometimes people will complain as I just feel that no matter how I breathe, I just feel I can't get a satisfying breath. Your breathing should never be effortful. Breathing should always be effortless. And if you feel that you're falling into that category, that your breathing is a little bit fast, is a little bit upper chest, you're gassing out during physical exercise, really start making changes to your breathing. And some of the tips are in this, in this podcast, play it over a couple of times, you'll pick it up and uh, start with that. Absolutely. And how do people get a hold of you? Where are your resources available for folks? So for those who oxygenadvantage.com, so oxygenadvantage.com is our main website. And if you go to about and then go to science, you'll see that I've put up many different articles in terms of what we do. And you'll see where we've put the papers there if people wanted to dig a little bit deeper into it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, there's different things there, resources there. And I give master classes as well to our master classes. They're $95, but, you know, they could be useful as well for people. And they're not overly expensive for people really to get, you know, a good foundation of what, what we, we teach. $95 for a detailed Two look hours. into your wisdom. Unbelievable. Unbelievable price. Love that. One last question for you, Patrick. Sure. How many years of knowledge is condensed into the Oxygen Advantage book? Um, it was four years in the making, and but before that, I had been working with working with individuals um, since two thousand and two. So I started writing it back in 20, 2011. I had a, a physiologist come over from Sweden, and I said I'd love to be putting this in. Part of it actually was Roger. We had a terrible eco economical situation here in Ireland because of banks and because of politicians that weren't up to the mark. There was huge anxiety 
and I was giving mindfulness courses, but I had 3,000 people come in doing mindfulness courses from, 20, from 2010 or 2009 up until about 2012, but none of them were men. And when I'm saying that, I'm saying maybe 5% of them were men, 95% of them were women. And I was thinking the man that was most messed up and the man that was at the greatest risk in terms of, you know, the, the loss of control of their mind, but why weren't they doing breathing? And it was because the word mindfulness is putting them off. They did breathing exercises. They don't want to know about it. And part of that reason that it just kind of evolved oxygen advantage was for the athlete. It was like, if I would go into a rugby team, these guys don't want to know about breathing, but what I'll do is I'll put them through the ringer and they, I'll turn them blue. And then they know that there's something in it because too often we feel that breathing is just one of those things that it's for a bunch of wimps or whatever. And I tell you one thing, put, put them in front of me and I'll put them through it. They'll have a different opinion at the end of it. But, <laughs> but we, we tie in, we tie in focus and concentration with that because we don't want just to have performance in the physical capability. I want to have performance for sleep. I want to have performance in influencing the autonomic nervous system. And I want to have performance of the mind and we can do that through the breath. Amen, Patrick. Amen. Folks, here's the deal. Patrick's been on an 18 year journey to get you this book, the oxygen advantage for a few bucks and for you to be able to use a little bit of your time we're talking about a game changer here. We're talking about changing your body, your mind, and your spirit through something as simple as breathing, which you have to do all day, every day, any day. Why wouldn't you want to do it to get the maximum return on that investment? And you want to thank an author? Here's how you do it. You get the book, and then you go to wherever you bought that book, and you leave them a review. And you give that kind of a uh, of feedback, you're now supporting all this tremendous work that Patrick has done. Imagine just getting a book and having 18 years of knowledge packed into that, and it's yours, just like that. Patrick, I want to thank you on behalf of the Hero community for coming on the show. Your wisdom in this arena is game-changing. I don't use that word lightly, and this is going to enhance the first responder community. More importantly, I absolutely guarantee it'll save lives, and we can't put a price on that. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks very much, Rudder. All right, heroes, and you know what I say. Until next time, be safe out there.